Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. The Jews and the British Empire by L. Fry. First printed 1935, reprinted 1976. The Jews and the British Empire The succession of events which have led to the almost total loss of British prestige in the sight of the world, the failure in the lamentable Ethiopian affair, Britain's recognition of Bolshevism in Russia and Spain, and mistaken policy in India, Palestine, Egypt and elsewhere, make it imperative for every Briton to inquire into the causes of the rise and fall of the British Empire. Those words, British Empire, have swelled the hearts of many Britons with patriotism, loyalty and devotion. Patriotic idealists believed that the term embodied the aspirations of a great people to spread the greatness of their acquired civilization over the uttermost ends of the earth. To them, possessions, colonies, dominions meant the extension of that beneficent power. For the sake of implanting or defending the reverence flag in remote places, they cheerfully and nobly shed their blood and sacrificed their lives. And the British Empire, emerging from the small kingdom of Great Britain, was born, developed and prospered. Eventually, the British flag waved proudly over islands and continents in all parts of the hemispheres. It crossed seas and oceans, commanded respect and even fear. Mercantilism Britain ruled the waves, and Britain was the head of a mighty empire. School children learned to love and reference its name. British youths worked for its development and dreamed of it in terms of growth and defence, while the population as a whole believed that the British Empire meant all the unexpressed national idealism they carried in their hearts. How deep must be the sorrow, how keen the shame of such men and women whose sad fate it is to witness the rapid decline of their once mighty country. Few were those who knew that apart from the idealistic, there was yet another aspect of the British Empire, namely that of mercantilism. That side of it does not necessarily inspire national pride, perhaps for the very reason that it does not fall under what patriots understand as national. Present-day British mercantilism is international. It has lived and thrived on British blood, work, resources and skill, but it is not British in essence. The Hansetic Monopolists Trade and commerce, as understood by the British, were based on the principles of trust, fair play, and honest dealings. An Englishman's word was his bond. It is this inherent straightforwardness which caused the English merchants of the Middle Ages and later centuries to become the victims of the Jews and wily foreign traders of the Hansetic League. It also stands at the base of the further exploitations practised upon them by Jews for the realisation of their messianic ideal of world domination. The rise of the British Empire is clearly linked to the Jewish messianic ideal, bearing today the name of Zionism, which aims at universal economic and financial control to be followed by political power in every nation. A short retrospect will make the statement clear. Throughout the ages, they have had, among many devouring ambitions, two specific ones, control of trade and commerce, and also that of bullion. In present-day parlance, it signifies control of national raw materials, of imports and exports, of price-fixing, and of precious metals, as also of all channels of distribution. Holland supplants Spain 
The gratification of such grandiose ambitions entailed penetration into all countries productive of supplies, as well as the control of means of transportation by land and sea. Penetration was to be effected by means of conquest. Nations were therefore lured, in turn, into undertaking adventurous campaigns to distant countries and succumbed to promises of glory and prosperity. Such is the history of the Spanish and Portuguese world empires. Spanish and Portuguese sailors and soldiers fought for their possession of lands where Jews later implanted their trade. Thus did Portugal have the monopoly of Oriental trade from 1500 to 1600. When the arrogance of the Jews who, along with wealth, had gained political power in the Iberian Peninsula became unbearable, and when their undermining of the Christian faith and traditions of those two countries led to the Inquisition and their subsequent expulsion, the Netherlands, having an efficient navy, were elected to replace the Portuguese. The Dutch were easily inflamed with the idea of creating a great Netherland empire. Just as the Spaniards and the Portuguese had done, they supplied soldiers, sailors and ships between 1603 and 1640. They drove out the Portuguese from all their positions at Goa, in the East Indies, Ceylon and Java. Jewish trade went on unhampered under the new nominal owners, but it was diverted to Amsterdam and Antwerp. Cromwell readmits Jews. Just as the Spaniards and the Portuguese had done before them, the Dutch paid with their work, skill and blood for their supremacy as a maritime power in the 17th century. The development of England's sea power and spirit of enterprise under Queen Elizabeth, the founder of the company of the Governor and Merchants of London Trading in the East Indies, in 1600 coincided with the Dutch expansion and made Britain loom as a possible formidable rival. As Jews were not then openly admitted into England, it meant that the independent British trade, if allowed to develop unchecked, might shatter Jewish monopoly. Ceaseless efforts were therefore made to obtain the repeals of the laws of expulsion. As is known, they were crowned with success when Cromwell granted the petition for their return, presented to him by Manasseh ben Israel in 1655. This same protector of Jews remained insensible to the anger displayed by English merchants when they learned of his concessions to the returning aliens. William of Orange The importance of Britain to the schemers for a world empire can be measured by the fact that two Jews, Ferdinand Carvajal of London and Isaac Suasso of Amsterdam, financed the invasion of England by William of Orange, Suasso alone contributing the sum of two million florins for this undertaking in 1689. The Dutch, not having been found by the Jews as tractable as had been anticipated, their doom was sealed, and in the secret councils of the elders of Zion of those days, Britain was elected to replace the Netherlands. The Britons of that period thought only in terms of colonies, and set out to conquer. In course of time, they treated the Dutch as the latter had treated the Portuguese. Constant battles raged between the two, until Dutch supremacy received its death blow in 1758, at the Battle of Chinsura. From 1781 to 1811, England wrested from Holland all her colonies. Meanwhile, the Dutch and British blood flowed freely. Jewish trade went on unshaken. It increased and prospered. France debarred. The financial Jewish power had been transformed from Amsterdam to London under William III of Orange, and the chief financiers there were Sephardim Jews, the Mendes da Costas, Arbudientes, Salvadors, Lopezes, Fonsecas, and Seixis, all 
Muranos. On no account was France to be allowed to develop an empire and become an independent rival, so England was used to wrest from her her colonies in India, America, West Indies and Canada. The more Britain expanded, the greater grew the Jewish power and control in the economic and financial realm. A kaleidoscopic look at the main events of British history from the early part of the 17th century will show the rapid expansion of Britain and her changing political control passing from her own hands into those of men alien to her faith, race and nation. At home, civil strife leads to the overthrow of monarchy, true to the traditions of Edward I, and is replaced by the protectorate of Cromwell, tool of the Jews. Cost of Zionism A broad conquest and emigration go side by side to extend British influence alongside with the growth of a colonial empire. Conquest is affected by ceaseless warfare on sea and land, against Spain from 1656 on, against the Dutch until 1757, against the French. India is gained by a succession of wars, Three Burmese Wars, 1823, 1882, 1885. The war against the Mohammedan rulers of Sindh. Two Sikh Wars, 1845, 1848. Two Afghan Wars, 1838, 1878. And Chinese War in 1856. The British go through the horrors of the Black Hole of Calcutta and the Indian Mutiny of 1857 to defend the rights of the East India Company. In the New World, they colonise America and behind them follows Jewish trade and slave traffic. They wrest Canada from the French, all at the point of the sword and bayonet. In Europe, They fight a succession of wars against different nations and secure more and more power in the Mediterranean after the Napoleonic Wars, the Crimean and Russian-Turkish Wars. Traders' Profits The laurels of victory gained by British bravery and valour cheer the hearts of the nation. Streams of British blood have flowed, Countless British lives have been sacrificed, but, meanwhile, Jewish coffers get fuller and fuller, full to overflowing. The Bank of England is their counting house, and the British carry to and fro the precious bullion acquired and stored by Jews. After the Napoleonic Wars, England has laid all her possessions at the feet of Nathan Rothschild. Henceforth, Britain will do the bidding of her real masters. She has become the tool of the schemers against all she holds dear, namely her faith, her patriotism, traditions, civilization. She grants the returned aliens equality of civil rights. They may and do become mayors over Christian population, and within a short time Britain is ruled by a Jewish prime minister, Disraeli, first and foremost a Jew and the flunky of the powerful Rothschild financiers. One of the consequences of this disastrous political mistake is the transformation of the national attitude of Great Britain and her colonies into that of the British Empire. Disraeli, who inspired it, knew what he was scheming for. The British people did not. But with him, Zionism is carried up to the very heights of the British throne, A Zionist world empire is on the high road to realisation. Role or Dalarai Under Disraeli, and inspired by him, as revealed in his works, there begins loud agitation for the return of Palestine to the Jews. That gateway between the East and West must be secured and the Mediterranean become a British possession to ensure the security 
of Jewish trade. Gradually, Zionism becomes the pivot of British rule. Egypt is an impediment. Egypt must be submitted. More British blood is shed at Taleb Kabir in 1882, Hasti, Khartoum, 1885, Handub, 1888, Toski, 1889, Afafit, 1891. In the Indian operations, 1896 to 1900, at the Battle of Umdaman. British blood it is which must swamp the Cairo to Cape Road. And what of the South African war to secure gold and diamond fields for the Jews and for them alone? Once more, British and Dutch blood drenched the battlefields. In the wake of British advance everywhere, Jewish trade has found new fields and gained security. It has grasped production at its source and started the era of trusts and monopolies. A Zionist Empire At home, meanwhile, Jewish power gets steadily stronger. But drunk with the notion of the mighty British Empire, Britons see only the surface. They still believe that they are ruled by their own monarch and elected men, and they fail to grasp the ghastly truth. The Great World War even fails to open their eyes. On the battlefields of France, and afterwards in Ireland, the best and most virile elements of Britain perish in order that for their British Empire, which they die to defend, there should be submitted the, the Zionist Empire. Henceforth, the history of Great Britain becomes that of Zionism. The setting up of what Britons believed was the British Empire has cost much blood. The time has come to open up the national ledger and reckon the actual costs of Zionism and the gains of Britain. Price Britain Pays For a period of over 300 years, Britain set up a glorious record of bravery and determination and an unexcelled example of remarkable colonisation work. Against this magnificent record comes the losses inflicted on British national honour, evidenced by her Jew-inspired policies in South Africa, in her dealings with the Arabs to whom the Balfour Declaration is a striking example of broken faith, the betrayal of Russia, her loyal ally into the hands of the Jews, her stifling of all British ideals at the Jewish Peace Conference and participation in the League of Nations seat of the Zionist world supergovernment. As a natural sequence has come the government's shameful official recognition of Bolshevism in Russia and Spain. Against a record of glorious prestige won and unrecognised by the whole world must be set up the fact of having been made the laughingstock of all nations when mighty Britain being now but one of the many pawns of the Zionist chessboard of the League of Nations supinely endured the moral defeats which Italy imposed upon her during and since the Abyssinian campaign. Material Losses And what of the material gains which Manasseh ben Israel made glitter in his letter to Cromwell? Materially, England has reaped no benefit. Her millions of unemployed are there to proclaim this sad fact. Economically, her Zionist rulers have fettered the initiative of her people, and through the Zionist PEP, Political Economic Planning, program at the Manchester School of Zionists, headed by the Rothschilds, Chaim Wiseman, and Israel Moses Safe and Co., Britons are being steadily deprived of liberty, property, freedom of initiative, and are burdened with intolerable taxation. British industries and agriculture have been and are being systematically destroyed by socialism, communism and Bolshevism, those offsprings of Zionism. But meanwhile, 
Jewish trade and prosperity have suffered no setback. They are thriving on international loans and the control of huge monopolies. Spiritual Losses Spiritually, international Freemasonry, the main channel of Jewish influence and of the English Grand Lodge, is as much a branch as the Continental Grand Orient and Scottish Rite Freemasonry, has laid low the Christian Church and given much scope to Kabbalistic theosophy, gradually destroying the spiritual Christian Aryan heritage of Britons. No asset appears in the national ledger to offset this great loss. The picture is one of gloom. The rewards and gains which colonising Britain might have expected to enjoy after her sacrifices and labours among peoples to whom she brought the benefits of her civilising influence, whose standard of living, moral and physical, she raised, for whom she built hospitals, instituted education and industrial centres, carried out costly schemes of irrigation and transportation, are all to be ruthlessly snatched from her. She is not to be allowed to enjoy the fruits of her sacrifices any more than were Spain, Portugal and the Netherlands. Italy supplants Britain The secret Jewish powers that she unwittingly served have used their socialist and communistic propaganda to incite the peoples of Egypt and India to revolt against her and decreed that Italy is to supplant her in the Mediterranean. Her navy and her manpower have been used to the limit by the international traders and exploiters of the world. Other knaves have grown powerful in this and the other hemisphere. They are coming into service and will gradually be pressed forward to occupy first place while Britain recedes and recedes. In Europe, power is to be partly diverted from London to Rome. To the British Empire must succeed the Roman or Italian Empire. The remaining part of the power goes to Moscow, Tokyo, New York. Honest Merchant's Warning Too late Britain is learning that not she was the ruler of the League of Nations, but the government which she mistook for her own since the days of Disraeli. And as an echo bridging the distance of centuries comes the complaint of those English merchants, true Britons who in 1684, soon after the Jewish invasion of England under Cromwell, in a case connected with the East Indies Company, said, Those Jews are aliens, infidels, and perpetual enemies of the British crown. <laughs>